Let's look, have a look at tokenization in this presentation and how we can use it to be able to protect data. So many companies need to uh, comply with uh, audit compliance regimes. So uh, in order to get a license to operate, an independent auditor often has to come in and, and be able to check that an organization is meeting with its uh, legal re requirements. So in the finance industry, we have the PCI DSS uh, requirements. In healthcare in the US, we have HIPAA. Then we have Sir Sarbanes-Oxley Act for Transparent Accounting and Reporting. And then GLB Act that allows banks, security firms and insurance companies to share and merge data. So these have all tried to improve uh, uh, the standards for protecting data, but unfortunately it hasn't been enough. So now GDPR has come along and there are four core elements to GDPR. The first is the rights of citizens to access their own, their own data. Then companies need to improve instant response where they can detect, respond and investigate and typically report within 72 hours. Then it calls for the increased usage of encryption throughout of the, uh, the, the different traces of uh, data within organisations. And then finally, it defines the concept of pseudo-anonymity, where it should be possible to hide the original identity of an individual from any data source. So the concept of hiding an identity has been around for many decades and we often created uh, a record which had personal identifiable information. So in this case, we might relate that to a primary account number uh, within a bank. What the, we then want to do is to create another database which has a surrogate identifier. So even looking at this identifier here, it would not be possible to trace it back to the identifier of the uh, source. The transactions that are made are then made with these surrogate identifiers so that someone looking at the transactions will not be able to link it back to the original identity. So what we need then is a surrogate mapping table where we take the real ID and map it to a surrogate ID. When we look at the transactions, we look at an ID here and map it back to the real ID and then with the real ID we can actually find the personal identifiable information. The problem with this though is it's possible within the data to be able to look at the transactions and then work out uh, which identity relates to which person and because it's a one-to-one -one mapping then once it's broken then it's broken forever. So tokenization <coughs> Is, is one route to improve data security. <coughs> and we're well used to this because we have our currency and that's high risk. We need to make sure that we look after our money, our cash. But then if we want to uh, play uh, at the casino or go to uh, Disneyland or travel, we can convert our money into tokens through an exchange. And this is a much lower risk here, where we only risk the value of the tokens and not all of our money. And also if we lose our tokens, then it might be possible to regain them back again by uh, cancelling uh, those tokens. And there are many occasions that we have information and data that we don't really want to leak out. So it might relate to bank account details, criminal records, voting registration, health records, education, driver license, passports, and so on. So this data should be held in highly secure environments uh, which are trusted. Then what we can do is through an exchange is to uh, issue uh, anonymized tokens which should not be traced back to the identity of the entity which uh, is the focus of the token. So if the tokens are breached in some way or discovered, it won't be possible to link them back 
to the individual who is the focus for the token. In this way, we can have low security environments and high security ones. So it should work by issuing tokens which can have no direct attacks, no crypt analysis, no side channels, no token mapping to map them the details back to the identity, and no brute force. So it shouldn't be possible to brute force a token to be able to discover uh, the details that are contained within it. So normally what we do, we feed in our data into a data processing infrastructure, we get some sort of output. The data as it risks, as it, as it travels through the data processing infrastructure, possibly onto third parties, and it will have to be stored somewhere. So we risk all along that uh, we will reveal the, the original identity of the data with inside the core data. But often we can't change too much about data processing infrastructure and we need to make sure that we're, we're feeding in data that looks kind of the same as our original data. In a tokenized world, we feed in the token into here and then can pass the token into a highly secure tokenization infrastructure. So this will be using the best of cryptography, the best physical security, it will run in trusted environments and so on. It will then examine the token and the request that has been made by the data processing infrastructure and give back the results in a highly trustworthy way and make sure that anything that is passed is passed in a highly controlled environment. This here will make sure that only the data that's required will be sent back and that it's also controlled by the tokenization infrastructure. The output can then relate to the input token uh, and can also be anonymized. So Visa defined a best practice for the finance industry when it comes to tokenization. The core thing is that we run it in a highly secure environment with the best cryptography available, 128-bit AES, 2048-bit RSA or 224-bit ECC, elliptic curve, and at least 224-bit uh, hash SHA signatures. It should be run within PCI DSS uh, types of, of environments and the focus is to protect the PEAN or the primary account number. The, four, the core of this is that this environment should be highly segmented away from the core infrastructure of the organization and it should apply network segmentation, physical segmentation, and so on. There should also be strong authorization within inside the infrastructure and where all accesses are actually logged and monitored. So 24-7 monitoring is key within inside this infrastructure. Tokens should also have a clear demarcation as to what should not be leaked out. So it should be core that it's just the identities that are required and and no credit card IDs are ever released and that all transactions which are logged must be protected so that an intruder cannot trace back the history of transactions. So for the token generation uh, we make sure that the PEN isn't possible to be recovered from the, the generation of the token. We can do this in a hash way so with a hash way, we can take the PEN, add some salt, at least 64 bits, and we'll create a hash of that to create the token ID. That's a one-way function. To be able to, to get the hash back again, we need the PEN and the salt, which will be stored uh, in the infrastructure, and it shouldn't be possible for an intruder to be able to try the salts within a reasonable time and work out what the PEN is. In an even more secure environment, we use uh, encryption to be able to use the uh, to be able to create the identifier. No tracking should be possible by any other uh, part of the organisation for the token. So we need clear segmentation uh, as to the business uh, processes that are required or allowed to be able to access the the token. We can also create a one-time use token where it might only be used for one transaction 
or a multiple one where we get multiple tokens uh, that will all link back to the same PN number, PN. Then we have the, cred the token mapping. So in this case, we map the PN to the ID. And a core part of this is to make sure that it's possible to issue a refund uh, to the customer without actually revealing the original PEN numbers. When we're dealing with credit card details, we have strong encryption used here to make sure that all the credit card details are protected and that we have PCI compliance for the storage and protection of them. Along with this, we have the key management, which is important to be able to keep all the required keys for them for the right amount of time and then access them back when they're actually required. So this is the environment that we would create for uh, financial payments. So here's an example here uh, where uh, Bob is, uh, tells the uh, tokenization server his card ID and his CVV number and that will then be registered as, as possibly a nonce value to be able to recreate uh, the original cards from these IDs. He will then store that and uh, will be able to uh, access it probably with some biometrics and a PIN number. And in this case, he makes a, a, a transaction, a purchase, and he gives his uh, uh, tokenized uh, details. The merchant then parses that onto the merchant acquirer, who will then recognize it's a token and pass the token on to the tokenization server and ask if uh, the card is actually valid or not, and if there's enough credit in the account. The tokenization server will then return back that this is valid or not, and then the merchant will know that the payment is successful. At the same time, the tokenization server can send Bob, in this case, a message to say that the transaction has been uh, successful. Along the way, it shouldn't be possible to, to uh, determine the, uh, the protected details. Okay, so what we need is a token mapping uh, system. So an efficient way to do this is to be able to create a random nonce and then to take the data and convert it into tokenized data and which has the, the same type of format of the original token. And this way, our existing systems can still check for details such as having a four at the start of a Visa credit card or a certain character set for a password. This is what's called format preserving encryption and it doesn't actually use the complex encryption that we see with the AES but uh, more of a mapping function. So let's have a look at this method. Okay so we have a credit card uh, number here and then what we'll do is we'll, we'll have a key which will then create a hash and that will create an encryption key. We then have a, have a certain alphabet of uh, characters. So they could be zero to nine or uh, upper and lowercase letters. So in this case, we've got our input string, which is an American Express card. We have our password and then the alphabet. We then encrypt that to give this value here. And then when we receive on, on the other end, we can actually detect that it's, that it's a, a American Express card because it has a three here. So we're only encrypting the additional digits after the three for, in this case. Okay, and we can do it for other things such as for a, a, a pin number here. So we might want to take a pin number. Uh, we have a certain uh, passphrase to generate the encryption key and an alphabet and we can see here that the value when it's encrypted is this and then when we use test and decrypt we get that value back again. Okay so if you're interested the code is here of the Python library that we're actually using. Another example that we have is, is within pseudo-anonymization. 
And a problem is that many systems actually have an identifier such as a matriculation number or a healthcare record that allows it to be easily mapped to an individual. And every transaction will have this unique identifier and can thus obviously be mapped back to the individual. This is an example here uh, where we have what's called a CHI number, 10 digits, which identifies a citizen or a patient within the healthcare record. The first six characters are actually the date of the birth of the individual. So it's possible to be able to search for a given date of birth. They go to find out uh, the, the possible identifiers. Then the next two digits reveal the gender, uh, odd for male and even for female. And then the last digit is just a check digit. So in this case, it's possible to reveal the identity uh, by examining the uh, CHI number. So this is what we might see for the medication record. So we could search through the identifier of the, of the CHI number to be able to find out the medication for that individual. So this isn't a good approach because it's easily to map that identifier but back to the individual. An improved approach is to take a password and a salt value, which is stored securely in the health, the patient health record for the identity. And then from this, the, the original core identity, we hash with, the, with a secret password and also with a salt value. So the first identifier, we can only map this to this only if we know the salt value and the password which is actually used. In fact, we could give the salt value to the user so that it wouldn't be possible even for the healthcare system to be able to map these identifiers. This will then be mapped to, in this case, the two milligrams of penicillin. By knowing the salt, we then take this value and we hash it again to receive the next identifier, which is here. So only by knowing the salt can we actually find out the next identifier. So in this record here, we can see that this identifier actually matches to this one and this one. And only by knowing the salt value can we actually find out what those identifiers are. This is a ledger approach, a secured ledger approach to our tokenization problem. The infrastructure that we create for these uh, this uh, format preserving encryption is based on these cipher structures. This is where we take blocks of information, typically 64-bit or 128-bit, and then split it into two. We take the left bits and then we add it on to a function of the key and the right set of bits and then do a modular add. We swap them over and do the same thing again. So these are parts of the key that are actually applied. The great thing with this is that on the other end, we just do the reverse. It's the same function, but we actually apply the key back in reverse. There is a standard known as the NIST standard SP838G, which defines two different types of format preserving Festo-based encryption. With this we have FF1, which has 10 rounds that we go through, and FF3, which has 8 rounds. We then define a radix, which is the number of characters which will be used for the formatted output. So in hexadecimal that might be 16, or if in lowercase letters that it will be 26. We then work out the key each time with the iteration number, i, and also for the thing that we're preserving. This is the original key, maybe the credit card number. And the key is going to be our secret key that we generate, say, from a password or a phrase. This will give us the key each time that we apply onto here. We then use an add operation for this to be able to uh, create the addition. Or, if we're decrypting, we create a modular subtraction. 
So in this way, we can actually convert our original data with however number of characters that we have. So we have n characters, which will be split into u and v, where u plus v will equal n. So another type, another method that we can use is what's called honey encryption. So with honey encryption, what we can do is that we can make sure that uh, uh, the output from a cracker will always look like a valid value. So normally what happens with encryption is that uh, Eve, in this case, will try the encrypted values and then get an exception each time until she doesn't get an exception, and in which case it's likely that she's actually found the key. With honey encryption, what happens is that no matter which keys uh, Eve tries, she will always get a valid output. So with honey encryption, we map a whole valid set of credit card details with a probability, and then the, out then the token that we produce will always produce uh, a correct uh, credit card value. So with honey encryption, what should happen is that uh, in this case, this is the credit card. And we're going to try the wrong key here and see what it gives us when we try to decrypt it. What should happen is that we'll get a perfectly valid credit card uh, detail at the end of it, in which the intruder can't tell if that's actually the valid credit card. So it just takes a few seconds to, to work. We can see here the result is coming back with this credit card detail and this isn't the same as this one. But the intruder can't tell that they haven't been successful because this looks like a perfectly valid credit card. If we now put in the right key, then what should happen is that we'll now get the result back which will equal the credit card that we're actually protecting. Okay, so we'll just give this a try and we should be able to see when it comes back, that the value returned back is perfectly correct, as it is here. So honey encryption allows us to be able to hide the uh, the card details without actually revealing that the key being used is wrong. Okay, so that's been uh, an introduction to tokenization.